Good Thursday afternoon to you. Welcome to Asia in Review. I'm Kerry Gershanik, and today we have a very exciting program and a very informative program. We have uh, three guests with us who are going to discuss one of the cornerstone programs that we have here in Hawaii for improving Sino-U.S. relations, improving relationships between specifically um, Chinese journalists who are studying here in the United States and their American counterparts, American journalists, in, in the hopes that this will help bridge the gap between the People's Republic of China and the United States of America. It's a, not a new program, but it's a very effective program. And here to discuss it today with us is Professor Gerald Cotto from the University of Hawaii. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. And the program that uh, Professor Cotto runs is called the Parvin Fellows Program. And it's a program that we'll discuss in much greater depth in just a moment. But we have two of those fellows who are here with us today. And uh, right next to Professor Cotto, we have uh, we have Mr. Chopin Wang, who is with the Xinhua News Agency. Welcome, Chopin. Thank you. Honored to be here. OK, honored that you're here as well. And then to my immediate left, we have um, Miss uh, Jin Yang, Zhao Yang Ma, but I'll call her sure because I have pronunciation <laughs> problems. Uh, the lovely uh, Miss uh, Zhao Yang Ma, or Sher, as we'll call her for the rest of the, sh of the show. Sure, welcome to Asia in Review. Nice to be here. Thank you. The, uh, the program that, that we're going to discuss is called the Parvin Fellows Program. And it is older than, I think, both of our young fellows who are here with us today. It, it goes back three decades, a little more than three decades. Um, Professor Kate, may I, may I call you Gerald? Sure. For the rest of the show. Gerald and I, uh, you know, full disclosure, we're good buddies. We're, uh, <laughs> we're friends. And uh, so I, I, if you don't mind, uh, out there in the audience, I will call him Gerald because he's my pal. Uh, Gerald, can you? Uh, Give our audience a little bit of background on the Parvin Fellows Program, why we're sitting here today to discuss it. Uh, I'd love to. Uh, the Parvin Program began in 1981 as China was uh, opening relations with the United States. Uh, at that period, the uh, Parvin Foundation in Los Angeles agreed to fund a program that would bring uh, journalists, young journalists from China for journalism training and, and uh, introduction to American culture. Uh, and the rest is history, so to speak. It's been going on since 1981, uh, and this is our 33rd class of fellows. Okay, describe the time, because there's a lot of people, you and I lived through that era. Why was this a groundbreaking initiative? Why, why was this significant? Well, this was significant because uh, in 1981, it's hard to imagine now that we, 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 we in the United States had uh, just begun relations with uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, it w was a very new and uh, emerging nation. Uh, at, that, at that point in 1981, the uh, ch uh, Chinese were about to start an English language news, news publication called China Daily. And uh, it's a huge that, publication now, but it's, it's a huge, huge publication. It's just now. starting in 1981. It was just starting, not, starting out in 1981. So uh, my uh, predecessors in this program had the idea that this would be a good opportunity uh, to, to bring uh, journalists uh, from the People's Republic of China to, to Hawaii for some professional training as well as some exposure to American culture. For, for many of these journalists, this was uh, at that time, this was the first time out of the country. Uh, and, and our goal was to uh, provide them with the kind of professional training to, to instill that kind of professionalism uh, in, in, in journalism in China. So here we are, what, 32 years later, and we've had how many Parvin Fellows come through your program? You know, I was, I was counting program. the other day, and we've had something like 330 wow. fellows over, that, uh, over those years. Um, we, this year we have uh, uh, six fellows, three from Xinhua News Agency, three from China Daily. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll talk to two of them in uh, just a moment, but can you tell us what are the metrics any, any good business looks at? Okay, we, we've been in existence, in this case, 32 years. We've had 330 or so um, products come through, human beings that came in one end 
one out the other end after nine months of a three-year program. What what are the, the, the best metrics you can give us? What What's the result of this program? How are these people doing, in other words? The people who have come here have taken leadership positions uh, in their news organizations. Uh, Such as? Uh, uh, Zhu Ling, the editor-in-chief of China Daily. He was amongst the first group of fellows to be here in Hawaii. He, he was a very young man then, and now he is editor-in-chief of China Daily. We have people who are high-ranking uh, editors in Xinhua News Agency. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, at, at one time we used to have uh, academics here too, uh, from Fudan, uh, Fudan University School of Journalism, the vice dean of Fudan very, School, very of famous School of Journalism. It's yes. a very famous school of journalism. The vice dean uh, was a former Harvard fellow. We have the uh, deputy editor in chief of the uh, Shanghai Daily, uh, um, who was a former Harvard fellow. So you, you, many of these fellows uh, ha have taken very uh, important positions in uh, the news media in China. A a as I expect, uh, you know, the current group, the very talented group of people, by the way, as you'll see in talking to them, uh, that one day they will be in positions of leadership uh, in. Uh, the news media in China. Okay, well, uh, let's talk to them. Let's find <laughs> out from them. Sure, you, uh, you've you served overseas for Xinhua. You've uh, served in some, some pretty dangerous areas, as a matter of fact. Can you tell us, um, how did you get into the field? How did you get into journalism? And, and uh, where have you been mm -hmm. working for Xinhua? Yeah, sure. Um, I was majoring uh, in a very small language uh, in college. In that's Hebrew. Yes. And uh, when I'm about to find a job, that's near the graduation from college, and uh, I had a very great chance to uh, to be in, enrolled in Xinhua News Agency, and I found it, well, it might be a great opportunity for me to uh, uh, working as journalist in the future, uh, and then I can use my my language, my Hebrew language, uh, in the Middle East. So I think it's a it was a quite a choice, good choice for me. Yeah, it, it and did translate it into your yeah. assignment to the Middle East, yeah, right? Yeah, that's why I got the job in Xinhua News Agency. Yeah, okay. most of the reason is because of the language. Where were you born? Uh, I was born in Henan Province. It's in the central part of China. Okay. Yeah, very cent very central part. And you're. You and I was I, and I grew up in Beijing actually. Oh, okay. I moved to Beijing at a very early age. Did you always want to be a journalist? Or was it just, I could speak Hebrew and no one else will hire me because it's such an esoteric language? How did, how, again, no, was that know, the, Xinhua, the driving force? Xinhua will hire people with that are qualified and uh, capable to uh -huh. be a journalist, not only because of language. Yes. But, but the top, the first reason is that you should have the ability to speak the language yes. where you will be sent to. And then you have to be passionate about th this career. So um, I, I would love to be a journalist uh, during college time. Yes. Yeah, since uh, when I was in uh, a freshman in college. Well, we'll come back to where you, uh, where you were subsequently assigned based on your, all these skills that you had and this uh, proficiency. But let's, let's talk to, to, to Xiao Peng now and uh, ask where were you born and how did you get into the, the, the field, the, the illustrious, glorious field of journalism? Uh, I was born and raised in Jiangxi province. It's a Gan the specifically is Ganzhou city. It's about eighteen hundred kilometers, one eight two zero wow. eight kilometers from Beijing. Eighteen hundred uh, kilometers yeah, from Beijing. And it's four hundred uh, four hundred kilometers from Guangzhou. Okay. Yeah, the southern part of China. Southern it's part big of city, China. Yeah. Yes. So it's it's really a far away from the Beijing, but I, I went. In 2008, when I was graduating, uh, it's actually it's two late 2007, I have to make a choice whether I have to uh, continue my, continue my uh, study as a PhD candidate or I have to uh, f jump into the job market. So at that time, you know, Xinhua actually uh, started rec recruitment in November. That, that's very early recruitment. They, Xinhua News Agency sent their group to Nanjing. I was studying in Nanjing University. Right. Yeah, it's a very ancient city. So they, they just organized a kind of 
examination for yes. all the candidates in, in Nanjing uh, who are interested in. I it's, imagine yeah, the competition the, was pretty yeah, intense. Uh, a yeah, lot of the, people want to work for All my classmates and and uh, there are other there are students from other universities surrounding in, in the yes. city of Nanjing. Yes. So I I just know this kind of thing maybe one day or two days before the examination. Okay, it's so this wasn't a lifelong dream of yours. <laughs> it was an opportunity <laughs> yeah. that knocked and, and the door yeah. opened for you and. Uh, you, and now yeah. you are a uh, now you're a Parvin fellow, which says quite a lot about you because this is a very selective program. Yeah, so that's okay. So, so you're from the southern part of China, and then I think uh, in our discussions earlier, uh, Gerald, you you said one of the, the changes that we'll talk about later in the Parvin mm -hmm. Fellows program is that uh, compared to the first fellows who came here 32 years ago, mainly from Beijing, mm -hmm. there's much greater diversity it's in really terms of geographic diversity. Spread. And I, I think it's a product of the fact that uh, you, you, people people could travel uh, around the country uh, right. a, a lot a lot more than they they could maybe 30 years ago. Okay, Xiao um come back to you for mm -hmm. a minute. Uh, we're coming up on a break, but uh, what's your beat? What do you write about? Uh, I write about the uh, how to say the Chinese policies of ministry. Ministry policies like environment ministry, the, some policies, environmental yeah. issues. I, I write, I write uh, basically in English for yes. overseas readers, for readers in America, uh, to, to understand environmental to understand issues, it, and yeah, environmental, yeah, policies environmental policies in the People's policies. Republic of China. Yeah, I also uh, write about, like, write a lot of stories about Chinese film industry. Oh, yeah. fame and glory! So we're talking. You're <laughs> Hollywood. Huh? Yeah. Is, is that exciting? Is that uh, is that a much more glamorous than policy walk stuff? Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of you know, uh, spy. How do you say? The politic news is kind of uh, 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 how do you say rice and and the and okay. the uh, film film stories like just like spicy. Okay, we'll come back to those okay. exciting stories in just a moment. We're up on a hard break, okay. so uh, we'll come back. And at the other side, you can talk to us about the glories of the film industry okay. in China. Okay. Okay. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, founder of Think Tech Hawaii. We are a digital media nonprofit that covers things that matter to tech, energy, diversification, globalism, and progress for our state, the state of Hawaii. We broadcast on community television, and on Oceanic Cable Channel 16. We also stream our shows and interviews live on the internet as both radio and video, and of course, we post them here on YouTube. We collaborate with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association to present monthly luncheon programs on subjects of interest to the business community, and we write for the Honolulu Star Advertiser. ThinkTech works hard to raise public awareness in Hawaii. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com, and come to our YouTube channel, Think Tech Hawaii. We hope you support our mission and that you like our work. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We're here with Asian Review, and we've got with us Professor Gerald Kato from the University of Hawaii, the director of the Parvin Fellows Program, which is a very important, um, a very important initiative in improving Sino-U.S. understanding through journalist-to-journalist -journalist contact, and we have two of the journalists in his uh, cohort of six uh, Parvin Fellows this year, and we have um, Xiao Young Ma, uh, who goes by the name Sure, it's her nickname, and we have Mr. Uh, Xiao Peng, uh, Xiao Peng Wang, who is uh, with Xinhua, as is sure, and uh, we're discussing how they came to be journalists and the exciting work that they do. And uh, Xiao Peng, just before the break, was telling us that in addition to covering policy issues, environmental issues that he describes in English in his, in his writings, uh, so foreign audiences can understand what's happening in China and in the environmental realm, he writes about China's Hollywood. He gets to meet movie stars. He gets to go to film openings. So carry on uh, your explanation of what you do with that. That sounds wonderfully fascinating. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, before that, I want to elaborate a little bit about Chinese film industry. It's actually it's in 2012, I think, Chinese, China's film industry is just second next to America, to North America film industry. It's the number two in the world, just as China's economy. So it's growing very, very hugely. So, 
And I've seen a yeah. lot of Chinese movies here in Hawaii. It's my yeah. favorite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and you get to cover it. I have to pay to see them. You get to go see them for free because you write about them, right? No, I have to buy. <laughs> oh, you do too. <laughs> that stinks. You, know, you want to be a journalist and yeah. write about it if you can't get free movie passes. Yeah, I sometimes I went to the preview. The preview yes. is okay, but actually it's. Is sometimes it's not no no good because preview right. you, you got all reporters right so right yeah so there you, you cannot get something exclusive oh so, I see so I usually I buy some uh, tickets and it's bargained of course <laughs> it's bargained, bargained from okay. online tickets I watch it and and then I I can write whatever I want to write but but so. you indicate there's a lot of other reporters in line buying yeah. those bargain basement tickets. Um, is it all glamour or I think you were you were talking earlier that there's a bit of danger involved here. Yeah, so I think it's 2009 when a uh, director, a famous director, Chen Kai Ge, uh, we, we traveled with him to Shanxi province, it's in the north part, yes. north part of China. It's a sure. very small town and Chen Kai Ge traveled with one of the most famous Chinese actress, Fan Bingbing, it's a heart throb actually yes. a very beautiful lady so uh, it's a small town in the mountain and every maybe everyone in the town just showed up so they they found that the media platform that he, which is there which, which just stood across to the the stadium where and that's stage, an elevated yeah. platform yeah. where you were all standing across yeah. from the stage it's, where yeah where the heart throb the heart was throb, and this, yeah. this beautiful lady was yeah and you know the local people just they swarmed swarmed Upon, upon, upon the stage, <laughs> so oh, no. it suddenly crumbled. I, I was taking picture and taking notes. So suddenly I, I go, I went down, and um, my my knees is on the ground. Incredibly oh, dangerous when yeah. a platform like that gets overwhelmed by yeah. by fans yeah. that are going up on the media's platform, yeah. and yeah. it had collapsed. So there's a little bit of danger involved, but uh, again, you get to see uh, you get to see all the stars. So that's exciting. Yeah. Sure, you're uh, your beat. What do you cover for Xinhua? Well, my job is not as fancy as Xiao Peng's. But, <laughs> but you but get to I go to exciting and yeah. dangerous places. Yeah, I've been to Israel for three years. I worked uh, as a correspondent, a permanent correspondent, uh, from 2006 to 2009. Where your Hebrew proficiency really paid off. So Xinhua yeah. made a wise choice, and and you applied mm -hmm. a very difficult language to learn, incidentally, and then you very, applied that. Not very. It's okay. <laughs> not 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 compared to English after you learned oh, Chinese yeah, yeah, all your it's life. It's more difficult than yes. English. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, uh, we were based in Jerusalem. Yes. It's the holy city for yes. three religions. And uh, uh, I covered most of my um, my stories was about uh, are about uh, political issues such as the peace process in the Middle East. Mainly, it's about it's a, uh, Israel Palestine peace process, and also about uh, the Israel domestic politics like Israel elections. Uh -huh. And I covered a lot about uh, a, a, a lot about the. A uh, high rank officials visit to the Middle East, like Condoleezza the Rice or okay, George so, W. Bush. Right, Secretary yeah. of State Rice and President Bush when they were going there. Yeah. Um, perhaps it would help our, our listeners to understand Xinhua a little bit better. Um, when you're writing for Xinhua out of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. you're not just writing for your Chinese domestic audience, right? You're writing. You're doing. Uh, you're writing for yeah, an organization that's very much like our Associated Press, or Reuters. So your 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 reports mm -hmm. are not just going back to the 1.3 billion people in the no, People's Republic no. of China. They're going out to the world. Yeah, because uh, we do, basically we we do three uh, uh, two versions of reports: the English version and the Chinese version. Yes. The Chinese version will go will go to the the Chinese media obviously and the English version is like AP's or writer story it's, it will be published uh, online worldwide it's, right. it's globally so Xinhua has has reached global reach whereas it started uh, at the beginning it was ba basically a domestic Chinese focused internally focused news organization is that correct well, you know in, in, in the 1930s Xinhua started as the uh, uh, propaganda arm of the uh, Communist parties who were up in the hills in the 1930s uh, with about three people. <laughs> it's expanded to an organization that has um, uh, thousands, uh, 10,000 employees. Now I think More they're up to 10,000 employees. Uh, they, they have bureaus all over the world. 
Chopang, I, I think, said 160 yeah, okay. bureaus yeah. worldwide. That's yeah. incredible. That's, that's and, large. And it's, if, if and you, it's increasing yeah. in recent yeah. two years. If you go to New York, they're in Times Square, beautiful office there. They're in Chicago, they're in uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Francisco I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they, they are a worldwide uh, organization, news organization. Um, and. Uh, one of, one, one of the things I should point out about uh, uh, their coverage in the Middle East, for example, you know, they're, they're, they, there's a big bureau, she you know, maintains a big bureau in Egypt, uh, also in Kenya, and you think about all of these uh, news, news, uh, uh, news reports coming out of Africa now, uh, there's a clear recognition by the Chinese, at least, of uh, of the importance of Africa to uh, at least to China, if nowhere else. There's huge Chinese investments in Huge in Chinese yeah. investments and, 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 and that's where they've directed a lot of their news operations for coverage, um, I, I, part because of that. And, and that is a reflection of, of some comments you made earlier about just how externally focused now the journalists from China are. And, Shebang, you, uh, you too have served overseas, sure, was in the Middle East and basically based out of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You got a chance to uh, be assigned to another Northeast Asian country. You want to talk about that assignment? Yeah, I went to Japan. Uh, it's Tokyo Bureau, Xinhua, Xinhua News Agency's Tokyo Bureau in 2010. You know, it's very turbulent years. Yes, yeah, right. so contentious year, yeah, 2010. Yeah, 2010. And and I think I went to Japan in a very significant period because in that year China surpassed Japan as the number two economy in the world. So, yeah, there's a lot, lot of things going on in Japan. Right, there are issues at sea, there are issues, uh, there are economic issues, it's huge and very large political issues. And yeah. So you, you were, both of you have been in the middle of tumultuous situations and your job was to cover it. Your job was to observe and write the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and, and report to the world, not just to the people of China, right? Yeah. The, um, the program that you're in now, mm -hmm. coming back to the Parvin Fellows program, uh, Gerald, um, it's been in existence since 1981. First class was yep. here in 1981, 82. Can you tell us, let's start with, with what it is that, that Schur and, and Chopin are studying this year and then we'll, we'll take it to how, what's changed from 1981 to what you're doing this year. Well, th uh, th this year, essentially when the uh, fellows come in in the fall semester, we, we, we have a set, uh, a set schedule for them, basically covering American studies, economics, uh, some journalism, introduction, introductory journalism courses, uh, some very basic courses, uh, to g allow them to get a taste of the University of Hawaii, what the University of Hawaii has to offer. Uh, in the upcoming spring semester, they'll get an opportunity to choose what kind of courses that uh, they'd like to, uh, to, to study. Uh, some may be interested in economics, maybe art. Uh, I even encourage them to take up hula, you know. I mean, yes. I, 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 think, I think that's a, a great thing to study, or even the Hawaiian language, because, because that kind of uh, intercultural kind of uh, training is, I, I think, invaluable to them. P perhaps more so than the basic journalism mm -hmm. courses you're talking about. Uh, Xiaobang, how long have you been a journalist now? How many years? Uh, about five years. About five years, and sure, you've ten been years, ten right? years. So it's, it's a, is it fair to say, Gerald, that it's, there's a difference in what was required in 1981 with the Chinese journalists who were just breaking oh, into sure. a new era sure. of freedom, or more freedom of the press? Sure. And, because uh, because, because now, I've, I have found over the 30-year period, well, the 10 years that I've been director of the program, at least, we've gotten people who are uh, have very excellent training uh, at the universities. Uh, right. uh, Xiaopeng here has a, has a master's degree. Uh, they, they, they have ang excellent language skills. Uh, to, to that extent, I think uh, some of the kinds of basic training that we used to do, even in journalism in the early years, uh, 
is not really re really as necessary as I think other kinds of uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, and other kinds of courses that the university has to offer. Uh, so uh, it may be a shift in emphasis because we, we, we have over the years gotten people who are a mix of people who are very experienced in right. uh, doing journalism to some who are very new to it. Uh, and that's good, it's a good mix. But, but the experience, the full experience, isn't relegated simply to UH Manoa. You no. We do other, we, we take do, these journalists to other we, locations. We, we go to other others. locations. You know, with the help of the host families, with the U.S. China Friendship Association, we've been doing, we've been able to do a lot of uh, uh, cultural kinds of things around the island. They're they're, they're going to visit the volcano in the uh, next uh, early next year. Uh, we we usually go and visit the courthouse uh, the, to talk to a judge. Uh, we take advantage of. Uh, uh, journalism programs that do come through town. La the, uh, over the weekend, we went to a investigative reporters and editors workshop that was offered here, so they got a little taste of American investigative reporting uh, and other kinds of activities such as that. We 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 want them to have a well-rounded experience in Hawaii, so that uh, it will. As I tell all of the former fellows, it will stay with you forever. Right. And one of the uh, well, one of the department. adventures you take them on is to go talk foreign policy and security-related issues at the uh, Pacific Forum, Center for Strategic and International Absolutely. Studies, so they get different perspectives <laughs> uh, from, from experts and, and in the field. I, I, you know, I, I think, by the way, that that's important. That that that, that as I tell all the fellows over the years. Uh, it's not so much, it's not important to me that you agree with any of the views expressed at these various forums that we right. go to, but that you, what's important to me is that you be exposed to a diverse, a diverse range of uh, opinions uh, and, and, and consider what they have to say. Uh, well, we're coming up uh, on a break right now, but at the other side of the break, let's take a look at some of these support organizations mm -hmm. that you uh, talked about a moment ago and how they, they contribute to the success mm -hmm. of the Barman Fellows here. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm Kerry Gershanik. I'm standing in for the irreplaceable David Day, renowned international lawyer who is on assignment right now. We have with us today three wonderful human beings and uh, just happen to be professionals in the uh, field of journalism. And uh, the first is uh, UH professor Gerald Cotto, who runs the Parvin Fellows Program. And two of his fellows, as sexist as they may sound, since we have one female as well as one male, so there should be a different name for it, but for now we're just going to stick with fellows. And uh, the first is Shur, who is, uh, go, she goes by Shur, and it's uh, Xiao Yang Ma, Miss Xiao Yang Ma. And then there's Mr. Xiao Peng Wang, who is a, a Xinhua journalist, as is Shur, and they're here discussing the nine months that they will spend at the University of, uh, of Hawaii under Professor Kato's mentorship uh, while they study American journalism and, and reach out to other organizations that give them a sense, a much better sense of America, of Americana, American thinking across the very diverse plane of political, cultural, uh, demographic experiences here. So what uh, we were talking about before mm -hmm. the break was that support structure, Gerald, that you need to make the Parvins Fellows Program a success. So the tuition basically paid for by University of Hawaii for these six Parvins Fellows. There's a fellows. tuition waiver from the University of Hawaii. Okay. We have the support of the, of course, the Albert Parvin Foundation in Los Angeles, which has supported the program over the more than 30 32 years. years. 32 yeah. years. Hence the name Parvin Fellows. Yes. yes. Okay. And the 
uh, locally the uh, U.S. China Friendship Association, which has uh, over more than 20 years now supported us through uh, by being host families. They are they are a great bunch of people who uh, um, care for all of the fellows every year. What, what does a host family do for the fellows while they're visiting here? Give me give give some examples. Well, they, they 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 go out on outings such as. Uh, going out on picnics or uh, par having parties together. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up. Yes. Uh, they'll be having Thanksgiving lunch and dinner probably with, with the fellows to show them what an American Thanksgiving is like. Uh, they'll be uh, taking them to on a trip to Volcano next year. Oh, nice. Over uh, on, uh, the Big Island. The Big Island. Yes. Uh, that, 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 that's, a, uh, uh, that's an annual e event. Uh, uh, they they they've just been uh, really helping helping them uh, in all aspects of life here in Hawaii, and I, and for that I'm I'm really grateful because uh, you know over the years budget gets tighter, you know money's that not available. I, I wish sometimes we could travel more, uh, but uh, I I work under budget restrictions like everybody else. But the host families have just been uh, really right there to to provide uh, all these kinds of friendships, going out to picnics, as I say, and parties. And, uh, Shall I just uh, say a couple of names of some of the leaders of the, uh, the organization? Oh, so Francis Gu, shout out to them. Francis Gu, uh, Walter Chang, Vernon Ching, uh, they, they, they've just been great. And uh, I, I, I think uh, wonderful. these fellows and uh, uh, all the people who've been here before will, will attest to that. Uh, that uh, I, I've had fellows who, uh, are, we're, we're crying when they're leaving at the airport because not so much they'll miss me, but they're going to miss <laughs> they're going to miss their 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 host families, and and, and I don't mean to do them wonderful to them. Well, it, it's good that you've been adopted uh, by <laughs> your host families that you've yeah. come here. But but let's uh, move away from the warmth and sentimentality of being welcomed into the the Hawaiian homes that you've been welcomed into, and get back to the more tedious issue of classwork. <laughs> what are you learning here, sure? What what is it that you're taking from this experience that's going to make you a better journalist when you get back to the People's Republic of China? Yeah, as uh, Gerald uh, mentioned, we take courses uh, like uh, American Studies, yes, Economics, it's microeconomics, and two courses about journalism. And uh, but I found myself learn more besides these courses. That means what I learned in daily lives is much more than what I got what from the getting? class, you it's know? It's the way with most of us going for our undergraduate yeah. and graduate degrees. We learn more outside the classroom. My but schedule, every day. You didn't hear that, Professor Gatto. <laughs> well, but I think Professor will be happy to hear this. Yeah, I, I think he will be too. <laughs> um, That's his intent, actually. <laughs> um, my schedule is very tight every day here. And I found time really flies. I've been here for nearly three months already. That was and quick. From it's that like three dinner. days, you know. When I when I look back, it's like <laughs> oh, just three days. And I because I have so tight schedule. I, I learn a lot. I I, I uh, besides the, the the activities that host family and Gerald uh, provide for us, I also uh, to uh, what I'm interested in like. Uh, now I'm learning scuba diving. <laughs> yeah. Could be very beneficial if you get back yeah. to the Mediterranean. Yeah. Yes. And I, I attend a lot of uh, seminars yes. uh, in the East West Center. In U, uh, near. Yeah, they have very broad. Uh, yeah, they have based, lots of seminars. Uh, seminars and yeah. activities and, there. And also, Kato will, uh, will organize us to the China seminar each month, every right. month. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, we met some senior diplomats that used to work in China. Yes. Uh, yeah, and who, who is very familiar with the Chinese culture and society. And we feel we are very, uh, it, and they give us very deep in, insight opinions. Yeah, the way, how they look uh, China. Yeah. Okay. Bang, you're, uh, you're getting what out of this too? The same thing, or do you have a yeah. different take on this? I will tell you one thing, you know, I, was, I went through this culture shock. This is my first time in America. Yes. And my first time in United, uh, the, in a classroom, classroom of United States. I was really shocked. You know, uh, 
when I went to the American history class, it's big class with 100 students. Yes. And I found, you know, students, they wear slippers. Slipper, slippers. Yeah, slippers, 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 they're very slippers. casual. Yeah, and they wear <laughs> pants. And, and went sure. to another class, it's a uh, uh, mass media class. And a student just put his legs on the table. On the, on the chairs, you know, before <laughs> but before he's a girl, and pointing to the pr professor. Well, I think and then the was, professor accepted it in yeah, class? Yeah, yeah. Which professor, would not have yeah. been done. Professor sat on the table. Wasn't yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it would have not have been me either, I assure yeah. you. I was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was surprised by the relaxed session of the classroom. What about the pedagogy? Right? What about the, uh, mm -hmm. the type of instruction? That you receive, can you compare that to what you received uh, getting your undergraduate and your master's in China? Uh, it's a different type of instruction technique here in the United States. Yeah, I think one thing struck, strikes me as very you know uh, juicy is that uh, American instructors emphasize a lot about cooperation. You have to cooperate with your classmates in order to present for presentation. Yes. And also, you have to do a lot of reading before class. The class is, you, you cannot uh, uh, count on the class to, to teach you a lot, of, to learn a lot of things. You have to do reading before you sit in the class. So uh, that's very, that is different. Yeah. Sure, is that, yeah. that your experience as well? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I bought, we bought, but all of us bought a lot of books at the beginning of the semester right. and it cost me a lot of money. It cost it, us a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, and, uh, the college text rack, all yeah. the biggest, and, uh, biggest rackets in the United States. And now I found yes. the books are worth it. Are worth just, yes. Yeah, it's very worthy because mm. uh, I read a lot of interesting materials from the book, like the American Studies. Right. Uh, we, we read uh, uh, like the document, documentary uh, materials yes. and also the cartoons. It's called Mars. Yeah, yes. mm -hmm. a famous cartoon, and um, uh, when I w when I was reading it, I found it very demanding and it, it's it kind of hard. You know, there's a lot of new knowledge. Knowledge. You had to pay me. a lot, and it was hard. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. But 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 after that, when I uh, yeah. finished all the reading, I felt oh, I, I really learned a lot from the reading from the book. Yeah. Okay, just would have been nicer if you could have bought them used at a significant discount, right? Uh, not yeah. significant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not for well, us. that that's um, it's good to know that your your class work is rigorous. It's good to know that there is a difference between uh, what you received as undergraduates and master's students over over in China. But um, I, the, the big question always comes back to. What do you do with it when you return to your professions, when you go back to Beijing or wherever you will be assigned, mm -hmm. when you go back to work for Genoa at the end of this? And uh, I believe we're coming up on a break, but um, uh, at the other side of the break, we'll talk about some of the differences between uh, journalism and the People's Republic of China and the United States of America, and then talk about the future of the program and talk about your personal futures. So we're on a hard break now. This is Asia. I'm Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. We do monthly luncheon programs with ThinkTech about things that matter to Hawaii entrepreneurs, investors, and business service providers. So join us on the fourth Thursday of every month at the Plaza Club. For information about upcoming events or to join our mailing list, visit hvca.org. See you there. Welcome back to Asia in Review. We're having a wonderful conversation today with two Chinese journalists from Xinhua News Organizations. It's, uh, we've got Shi, who is, whose real name is uh, Xiaoyang Ma, and she's from Xinhua again in the People's Republic of China. And her fellows uh, here, her partner in the Part and Fellows Program is uh, Xiu Peng Wang, who is also a Xinhua journalist and their professor, Professor Gerald Gatto, a little a legend of sorts over at the <laughs> University of Hawaii, but also what we didn't go into about uh, Professor Gatto is uh, 
He is a, a journalism legend here in Hawaii. If you, for those of you who've been around who are a little older than 21, you'll know that, uh, that Professor Kato worked for the Honolulu Advertiser, a distinguished print journalist. He also was a broadcast journalist, KITV, KGMB, and before that he worked in California in the journalism field. So he's, uh, if there's anyone who is, is better qualified to run the Parvin Fellows Program here at the University of Hawaii, I can't think of it. Gerald Kato is very distinguished distinguished scholar, a very distinguished educator, and a distinguished journalist, and we're, we're very honored to have all three of you here with us today. We're in our last segment. Went by quick, didn't it? So what I'd like to talk about now, there's, there is a difference in the People's Republic of China and the United States of America in terms of state control. The Communist Party of China, of course, runs the People's Republic of China. It's the leadership of uh, the, the People's Republic of China and the propaganda department owns most, if not all, of the news media. That's the understanding of most Americans. What is it really like in China? How do, how, how do you work on a day-to-day -day basis at Jinhua regarding the relationship between mm -hmm. the party and the paper, the party and Jinhua? And I'll start with you, sure. Um, the principles we we are working is to be accurate, to be fast, to be efficient, and to be professional. That's, I think, all of us, all the staffs in Xinhua News, Asian, news, news Agency believes in these kind of principles. No different than the, the principles that, uh, so that, we that are, reporter Gerald Gatto yeah, would have worked on. You know, Xinhua News Agency has very good reputation worldwide, and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, in, in China, and uh, uh, we are recognized as the professionals, the me professionals of media. So I think there is, if, uh, if you're talking about the way that we're working, I think there's no much difference between we, us, and the US, uh, the American journalists. Okay. Shobang, yeah, your I, thoughts? Yeah, right, in English, so, you know, it's kind of global competition. For example, if there is a heavy fog in Beijing, we have to write very fast in very insightful way. So it just it's kind oh, of. Are we talking yeah. fog or are we talking smog? Yes. Are smog. we talking pollution or are we talking real fog? Yeah, it's environmental issue. So it's a kind of global competition we have to compete with New York Times, AP, you know, Associated Press. So it's, we have to, you know, sweat every. We have to sweat to to get some insightful things. So it's it's just like what they are doing in America. The um, the different systems. Uh, there's different perspectives. We had talked earlier in, uh, before the program that American journalism mm -hmm. is perceived in China as being very America centric. Is how, is that how you would describe the Chinese perception of the American news media? Start with you, Shopin. Uh, sorry. Could you, could what? I, oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll rephrase the question. In China, 1.3 billion people, you also get American news media over there. It's somewhat restricted, but you still get the New York Times. You still get the Wall Street Journal. You still can get some of our broadcasts over there. It's, it's, it's censored, but you do get it. What is the perception of America's news coverage within China? Uh, how do you say? You know, nowadays, the Internet in China is really popular. The WWW is very popular, and people, are, you know, the internet there is no boundary, so people can get information. There's no censorship on the on the internet. Uh, no, uh, you're talking about yeah. internet freedom, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there, there are ways of getting around any kind of censorship. <laughs> okay, I don't know because I, uh, as a reporter, we have to check the internet source to to for stories we have to write. So we we don't we, we don't know, you know. Yeah. So. But but uh, again, the perception of American. Uh, what I what I understood was, within China, uh, there's a perception that all the American news media focuses on is America. So is that is that a valid uh, no. perception? No. Can you okay? Sure. Tell us what the view of American news coverage Personally, is within China. I view, I view the, China. the U.S. the American uh, media. They're very uh, they're very professional. Okay. We have to learn a lot from from the like see like the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. even though we have different opinions about a certain topic. Yes. But they're, I believe they're very professional, and they have very uh, ex um, I mean very uh, 
um, thorough uh, coverage about everything. They're fast. They're very fast, and uh, they're they're very bold <laughs> to to speak. Yeah. To speak out. Okay, we have about two minutes left on this one-hour program, and so what I'd like to do is turn it over to uh, Professor Kato for a moment to be professorial. Take us a quick review of the past 32 years, and then take us to where you see the Parvin Fellows Program uh, going in the future. Over the past 32 years, we've had, uh, as I said, more than 300 journals from China yes. come through the University of Hawaii. I like to think that uh, the University of Hawaii, uh, through this program, has contributed to the growth of professionalism uh, in journalism in China, professionalism about which uh, Sher uh, and uh, uh, Xiaopeng here are, are, are representative of. And we, we want to uh, carry that, that tradition on into the future as long as we can. I think uh, to have more journalists come here and uh, be part of the Hawaii experience. And it does, uh, I, I, I think, that, and that, that's the future I see. We, we, we build on this uh, relationship, this vital relationship between China and the United States. We build it one person at a time, one journalist at a time. And uh, sure, you know, we've only had 300 over 32 years, but you know, they're, they're, they're an impressive 300 and an influential impressive 300. Impressive and influential, and, uh, and, and, and they are the future of China. As I, I think uh, the, these two journals are representative of that, and we hope to continue in that tradition because I think uh, Hawaii and the University of Hawaii have a lot to offer, uh, and uh, it does. It does stay with them for forever once they've come through this program. Well, let me thank all three of you. Um, let, let me get the, the, the order correct. Ma Zhao Young, yeah. sure. Uh, Shishen, and uh, I'll, I'll thank you. And Wang Xiaopeng, thank you so much. And uh, Professor Gerald Kato thank from you. the University of Hawaii. I think your discussion today has been immensely beneficial to our audience in understanding the nature, of course, of the Parvin Fellows Program, what it is you're getting out of it, but also an understanding on a broader scale those steps we can take locally that help, that, that build a foundation for Sino-US relations that will allow us to work together peacefully in the years to come, to build that strength, that cooperation, that understanding. And so I applaud your program. I'm, I'm again, very, very pleased that you chose to come on our, our show today. Mahalo. This is, this is mahalo to all mahalo. three of you. This is Asia in Review. This is Kerry Gershanik, David Day, your, your Usual host and a much more articulate host than I will be back next week from his mission overseas, and I'll leave it at that.